Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hope we're still doing fine here. Uh, so my topic will be around asset health uh, management. Uh, so I believe a lot of the audience knows what this is. So please raise your hand if you don't know what is asset health management. Okay, very good. And uh, I hope uh, deep learning and survival analysis there uh, to trigger more interest. And then I will show you uh, what I was doing in this topic. So I will go directly to the motivation. Uh, so we all have heard like a lot of successful stories about deep learning in different fields, like in speech, in uh, image. There are like really good uh, methodologies and uh, results there, even products. Uh, but in terms of uh, asset health management, uh, I think my personally just try to start to use the tool uh, and then to uh, really think uh, what might be useful uh, to get something from deep learning to apply to uh, PHM. Uh, so the first thing I started with is, I think deep learning can optimize the feature engineering and the final object goal uh, as one step. So that's what amazed me the most. So I, I will try to start from there. Uh, so why is that? Uh, including myself, I believe a lot of people also uh, do project in the two uh, steps way. So first, when you get data, you clean them, and then you extract feature, features from them, either use signal processing or just doing like a mean, uh, maximum, uh, like a moving average, all kind of things. After you get a set of features, you give them to the uh, model. The model could be a classifier, a regression, right? And then you try to uh, take a look at the accuracy. So if your accuracy is not good, maybe you'll try another different classifier, right? Or you go back to your feature engineering step, you try to extract different features, uh, try to improve your accuracy. So what I try to do here is basically try to use this deep learning uh, by using their uh, mechanism to basically go directly from your data to your final objective. Uh, so my problem will be basically for asset management. So imagine you have a fleet of assets. So this asset could be uh, like trucks, uh, in my case study, I will show you later. And this can also be like a lot of uh, applications you are dealing with, right? How help me to think about it. If you are in energy, maybe this can be gas turbines, that's your asset. If you are in aviation, this can be like jet engines, uh, like us. And also, uh, just to uh, make a broader, like a bolder argument, even if you are managing like a group of uh, clients, you want to detect what is the retention rate, you can basically uh, use this type of uh, technology to try to build a model on that. Uh, so the input of, uh, of the model I'm talking about will be like sequences of data. So you take a bunch of measurement, uh, for example, daily, monthly, or even like uh, weekly or yearly, things like that. Then you have a sequence of data of uh, measurement. Uh, they could be like uh, uh, current voltage, vibration, uh, anything that you are measuring there. And then the thing you want to do is like, you want to see like an individual uh, failure probability, right? In the future, you want to predict it, you want to detect it. Uh, so in that way, the survival analysis basically give you like a, a failure probability or cumulative failure probability, a hazard rate or things like that. Then you can basically uh, monitor the uh, uh, health condition of that asset over time. Uh, and then here, uh, I learned a lot of successful story in LSTM. So basically, I have the sequential data, so I want to try this first. And then uh, a lot of people, so survival model is not new at all. People do reliability analysis, do healthcare domain, they use that a lot. Um, but in deep, deep learning domain, people do regression and classifier theory. So here, uh, my problem is survival analysis. So I don't have a tool at that time when I started this. So I basically tried to implement this by myself. So I just combine uh, these two algorithms together. Uh, so here is the uh, overview of the uh, model that I did in this case. Uh, so the bottom is your uh, input of the sequences of the data. And then you use LSTM to basically transfer uh, to deal with the sequences. And after you get the output from the LSTM, uh, you do a mean pooling. And that mean pool features basically goes to the next layer, uh, which I call it uh, feature learning layer. So basically you can further build uh, different layers of uh, neural nets on top of that and also like try to learn your uh, features in a more deeper way. 
uh, but I just do one layer here. Um, and then after that, uh, those learned features goes to the survival model and then try to learn uh, the failure probability. Uh, more deeper into the uh, each layer uh, of the structure, the first layer is our STM. So I have a figure there taken from some block. Uh, I have a figure courtesy there. So this is another way to admit I didn't do anything new to this model. So I just used their uh, RSTM model here. So my contribution is not here. Uh, I will ignore it. And then the next layer, so when you get the HT uh, from the output of RSTM, you do a mean pooling and uh, this uh, feature becomes an edge. Then you can simply put it into a very basic uh, neuron. Uh, one layer of a neuron and try to learn it further. So you can reduce the number of the features, for example. Uh, you can do it in RSTM as well, uh, but also you can further learn. And you can stack these uh, layers uh, of uh, neural nets uh, and try to learn more. And then finally, it's a survival model. So this survival model is also uh, well studied. Uh, and we are using a uh, parametric uh, model here. Uh, so the good thing is here, uh, if you really have let's say most of the assets are still in good condition. You have very less asset uh, that failed, right? Uh, so the good thing for uh, parametric based model is like you can still uh, use it. Um, but the bad thing is like you, you have an assumption that you should follow some uh, shape of uh, distribution for the, uh, for the time. Uh, and then the point is like when you get the P out of the friction learning layer, this B basically goes to the uh, Cox uh, proportional hazard model. So that is also well known. It's basically like a linear model uh, in coupling with the distribution of the time that the uh, assets stay uh, healthy. And then our uh, likelihood function is basically uh, given all the asset data that you have, uh, the likelihood of those asset data. The first term basically there is the uh, uh, like uh, uh, hazard rate uh, given the uh, observation, and the red one basically deal with the red censoring. So red censoring in this case meaning uh, if your asset uh, hasn't failed yet, so you have to add another term, which is accumulation uh, term, uh, the big edge there. So if you're interested, you can uh, take a look at the uh, paper. Um, and then just a further note on the feature learning layer. I haven't done like anything special uh, in the feature learning layer here uh, in the middle. Uh, but I do have tried uh, before uh, to use like a one layer of uh, RBM, which is called regularized restrictive Boss machine. So which also is the uh, fundamental algorithm of deep learning. Uh, so in this case, uh, I tried to use this as a generative model. Uh, so in the literature, people basically do a lot of regularization, uh, basically the lambda, the term here, try to uh, prevent, for example, weight decay or try to um, e in ensure some sparsity for the hidden node. But here, like for PHM, so I tried like a very simple thing. I just want to change this term to basically optimize uh, the monotonicity of the feature output. So if you want to do some uh, prediction task, for example, try to predict the remaining use for life. Uh, so you want to get some feature that is uh, linearly, like a mon 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 monotonically increasing or decreasing. So in, in that case, maybe everybody's happy, and then you can build some model on top of that. But in real case, it might not be uh, that. Uh, so if we put a regularization term uh, on this layer, then we can output some uh, feature potentially has better uh, trending, uh, then you can get better results from the uh, prediction. Um, and then go back to our objective function. So that is basically uh, the likelihood function in the previous page. Uh, so the objective is just uh, doing a neg negative neg log, log likelihood on that. Then we try to minimize this uh, cost function. And uh, I implement this one in uh, Python. I use a CNO package. So if anybody used that, you know. Uh, the good thing is like you, have, you just have to give the forward prediction uh, equation to your code, and the, all the uh, gradient is calculated by the package using their gra graphic theory. Uh, so in the case, I just do a uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent, try to minimize my cost. Uh, and then we're good on time. 
Okay. And this is the first case study. So basically, we have very small uh, set of data collected from um, uh, a fleet of trucks. Uh, so we have like uh, five year, a little bit more than five years of data, but only 20, 27 uh, mining trucks. And uh, uh, there are like logs basically record the daily uh, fuel consumption, number of loads, and also how many hours it has been running and also how many distance this, those trucks has been driven uh, when there's no load on it. Uh, and then the data is so uh, small, so if you take a look at this, probably this is overfitted. <laughs> so, uh, but my point is like, um, by combining this uh, LSTM and the uh, uh, survival, so you can directly go from your data to the final prediction, which is like a failure pro probability over time. I did do some uh, leaf uh, like several out uh, to do the cross validation, which looks uh, okay, but the result is still uh, looking overfitted in some way. Uh, and and then I basically take another open source data uh, about the data center hard drives. So this is open sourced by uh, Backblaze. I think a lot of researchers and also data scientists are using this data uh, to validate their model. And uh, uh, they have uh, like uh, multiple years of data on uh, hard drives, I think they have like more than 41,000 different hard drives made by different manufacturers. And then they take uh, the model number, serial number, uh, capacity, and uh, they record whether this hard drive failed. And they also record the uh, uh, smart signal from the hard drive. So this is the industry uh, standard in the hard drive. They have to the report, for example, how many uh, like relocation of the bad sectors. Uh, I'm not the expert in that, but they record all those. Um, Values uh, according to the state status of the hard drives. So in this case, I just uh, focus on one of the models of the hard drive which failed the most in the past two years, and uh, it has like only two million samples uh, for for this particular uh, drive. Uh, there were like four thousand seven hundred uh, drives in total, and uh, among which one thousand six hundred failed. So in this case, instead of outputting like over time fair probability, probability, I just want to try use the endpoint prediction, try to classify them into good and bad. And as you can see, uh, not very su surprisingly, the diff model uh, is not very <laughs> way better than the uh, traditional Cox model. So the ROC I got for diff model is 0.72, and the Cox model is like 0.69. So it's uh, still good, but if I take a closer look at this ROC curve, so for the deep model, uh, if we want to achieve like a true positive rate around 0 0.8, uh, our false positive rate is like around maybe less than 0.4. But in that one, if we want to achieve 80% true positive rate, the false positive rate can be, I don't know, like 0 0.6 or something. So potentially, if we set the threshold right, we can get a better result from the deep model. Uh, so that's basically um, what I have. And for uh, the future, basically, I think, as I mentioned before, this can be potentially applied to a lot of the cases that you may be interested in. Uh, and also, we can design more uh, PHM-specific um, feature learning methodology for that uh, middle layer. Um, and of course, this is like a two-state model. If we want to do, for example, semi mark model, for example, we can use it to uh, extend this to, to that. And then uh, the last one, just something I'm working on and try to think hard, how to basically explain the predictions making by the post deep models. I use a maybe very simple linear explanatory model to customers and the people who don't really know uh, a lot about uh, deep learning. So that's all.